still doing. Just want to make a, a video just about gardening Eden. Now what that is, but also how that fits into our understanding. I think we we thought about it uh, as this physical sort of place in the garden. And I think that's true. I think it is. But I also think it's not limited to being a physical place or physical manifestation. I think that heaven was superimposed over the atmosphere of heaven. Probably not in the way that we've experienced. Probably more of a real, tangible atmosphere of heaven's presence, of God's presence. And I think there are a lot of clues in the book of Genesis and various other parts of the Bible, including. Ezekiel 47 and Revelations you know, 21 and other various places that point uh, to this this garden what it is uh, for me um, I don't want to slice and dice scripture up too much I just want to try and get to the point as much uh, well, as soon as I can, I've, I've got a habit of you know creating a lot of context to try and get people understanding. That's my whole thing, and a part of my ministry is to try and bring understanding. So I like to make my context big, <laughs> but with a heart to get you understanding. So see if I can cut to the chase. The garden. Of Eden is a place um, probably a better next explanation rather than a place is it, it's more of a personal or the functionality of a personal or presence and that presence takes on a corporate expression or manifestation where all of us together create this atmosphere or can create this atmosphere called the Garden of Eden. Uh, the Hebrew word for garden um, means bright. Uh, why is this a concrete language? Uh, the Hebrew concrete language um, is discerned through or interpreted through the five physical senses and it focuses on functionality. Uh, so the garden um, and it's it can be it can be defined as a bride and so those two words can be actually interchangeable. Why? Because the functionality yeah, at its core is that you put a seed in a garden, it'll produce fruit. You put a seed in a bride, it'll produce fruit. So that's the functionality of this concrete language. And so when you, you're talking about symbols, and symbolisms, and, um, especially through the Hebrew language, when we begin to understand that you know, words take on a deeper meaning and so the garden is this has this functionality to produce fruit same as a bride but notice the garden is called Eden Eden means uh, pleasure uh, so in short the word garden in Eden means a bride of his pleasure or the bride of pleasure but the word Eden means a lot more it means a, a spot it means an open door it means presence and it also means um, 
pleasure. So you to unpack that word all together, those different defining functionalities of that word mean this that Eden was this place where, 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 you know this spot where it also means a moment sorry I forgot to mention that definition it, it, there's, a, there's a spot where uh, there is an open door for a moment where the presence of God enters and that gives him pleasure and so you can get your own sort of definition using those functionalities but that yeah that to me it defines what this garden is or what the garden of Eden is and what what's what's its functionality and not only what it is but who it is um, it's my belief it is that we are the garden of Eden that we are the bride of his pleasure we are defined as the bride but also we are this garden how do I know we're a garden well we're trees we're trees of righteousness we're defined as um, these things of function in the Hebrew language that uh, is designed to give us an understanding that uh, to, to, to show us how God sees us he sees our function. He sees, okay, you're, you're, you're this person who is meant to produce fruit. And I want that fruit to go, you know, to, to multiply. And I'm not, I'm not only want it to multiply, but I want it, I want you to fill the whole earth with it. And then I want you to subdue the earth with it and have, dominion with it and of course that's the Genesis 128 mandate uh, that we've all been mandated we were once mandated in Adam to do this but that mandate has ceased in Adam and now there's but I believe we picked up the baton in Christ to fulfill that mandate I don't think we can do that in Adam anymore I don't think we can be fruitful in Adam because of the seed that is within his functionality which is good and evil uh, but in Christ we can bring forth the fruit that God loves which is the fruit of life of the tree of life which is love joy and peace long suffering temperance meekness faith goodness you know, all those good things um, and not only bring them forth and manifest, but we get to fill the whole earth with it. Um, and then to subdue and have dominion like we ought to have in the first creation, the first Adam. <sighs> but because that... Um, particular being was, eh, I don't like using the word spoiled but was spoiled um, we couldn't do we can't do it in Adam you know, there's another seed there was another seed in Adam so that has to die that seed has to die but the good news is you know Jesus took that seed and took it yeah, on the cross and killed it and buried it and all that sort of stuff but now in this covenant that is Christ, in this new life that is Christ, in this new, I like calling Christ a new creation because that's what it is. That's who, it's not, it's, it's another, it's another species, if you like. And we are in that, uh, just like we were in Adam. We were in Adam when he sinned. And because of that, that nature is passed down. But the thing is, in Christ, we are in Christ, and we that nature's passed down to us too. We get to walk in that, we get to multiply that and fill the whole earth. Okay, so we have this garden. See, the Garden of Eden, uh, there's a lot of descriptive points in the Garden of Eden. I'm trying to, in my mind, 
to see which is the best way to cut to the chase. When Adam and Eve were banished from the garden, if you want to put it that way, there's a cherub that was placed at the entrance of the garden. Uh, and was there to guard the way to the tree of life. So, um, the, so we have this picture of the way to the tree of life. And you have this cherubim who's guarding the way to the tree of life. Um, God comes to Moses first of all he goes to Abraham makes his covenant with him it's an everlasting covenant then he comes to Moses and says look here I'll make a covenant with you too uh, <clears throat> but I want to show you a few things come up to the mountain here and all we'll have a we'll have a chat and so he does he gets the pattern for this, this tabernacle he brings it back down uh, you know this blueprint and and then he recreates this, this tabernacle. Um, and he, he at, at the base of the mountain. And and has this outer court and has, and it has this in, inner court, the Michigan. Uh, and in the inner court, you have this holy place and the holy of holies. There's all these various uh, components to the tabernacle have the brazen altar in the outer court, which is the first thing you see when you come into the entrance of the outer court, and then you and you see the brazen labor, which is just outside of what you call the door of the entrance into the holy place, and then have these five pillars um, and a veil entrance into the holy place. When you go in on your left, um, you have the golden menorah lampstand the seven branch lampstand and on the right you have the table of showbread and in front of you have the altar of incense uh, and then that is set before another veil and this veil is a thick veil but what was in, uh, knit within the veil was this cherubim Cherubim, you know, the beam in the Hebrew is the plural form of a word. So cherubim meaning more than one or more more than one functionality. Uh, same thing with the word face or presence in the word in the Hebrew, which is panim. Um, pena is the uh, the single form of, of the word, but nim is the plural form. And when it refers to a face, it is saying that this this the face has uh, more than one function. So you can smile with that face, or you can be sad with that face, or you can look angry or whatever. And so, <clears throat> and and it and it defines uh, your face will define what type of presence you create. And you miss that's why the the concrete language. Um, will weigh heavily on the, the functionality of a word to describe uh, or to, to give forth or yield its definition. It's so, like, you know by the look of somebody's face when you enter into a room, if they're sad, then the presence in that room is going to be sad. Yeah, and you feel it, you feel presence. But that same face can be happy and you can walk into that same room with a different look on the person's face you're looking at and it can create a totally different presence. So panim, the plural form, is, is just uh, highlighting that the, the functionality of that word. The same thing with cherubim. It's the functionality of the word. It's, it's the plural form. So... <coughs> I don't know why I went down that little goat, uh, that <laughs> rabbit trail, but but when we get to the veil, we go through. Oh, we go through the veil. Then we 
when we meet the the Ark of the Covenant, which is you know have the mercy seat on top, you know, which is the one talent of gold, one piece. Of cherubim on either side, the, the two are one. It's, it's the the plurality again in the in the concrete language. I don't have time to get into all this, but when it's placed on top of this box and inside the box are these three you know, items: the hidden part of manna, the staff, and the, the tablets. But Revelations 21 says this this river came out of this. Ark, you know, out of it flowed. And it talks about you know, the, you know, on either side of the river, there's a tree of life. Uh, Revelation, uh, Ezekiel 47, paints a similar picture. You know, have this tree, and for me, the tree is the, is the cherubim there. Uh, the tree, you know, the tree is you know, is on either side of this river. It's this one piece, um, and it's. Uh, has this 12 men of fruit on it, which is, you know, the, the, for me, it's a tree of life. Um, and so for me, the, you know, the, the cherubim is this, um, ha has this functionality to not only guard the tree, but also to, to, to be the tree. And if you can hear that, then you'll be able to hear probably some other things I'll, I may say a little bit further down the track. And so what I'm saying is you've got all of these components of the Garden of Eden in this tabernacle, in these four walls, in the Holy of Holies, <clears throat> at the base of the mountain, and God would come down on the Day of Atonement and he would fill the whole tabernacle with the cloud and people would hear his voice in in the, in the tabernacle before the voice was at the top of the mountain. I submit to you that the tops of the mountain was the garden after, if you want to call it the fall. It was... Uh, the geographic location limited people from entering into the garden. Um, I don't believe it was, you know, the garden was limited to a geographic location, but I, I'm saying it just, it, it was hard to get to God sort of thing. You know, that, that's what the language to me, that's how it speaks to me. It was hard to get to him. Um, because we made it hard to get to him. And God said, no, look, I don't like this separation from mankind, from my, my children. Take this garden or the, or the blueprints of the garden and make a prototype for me in the earth. Make it out of your hands, man's hands. Use, you know, timbers and, and stones and all these different materials to and build it for me so I can come and dwell with them if it's because they don't want to come up here and do, you know and dwell in my presence so Moses okay okay God I'm going to do that and then and he builds this tabernacle of Moses and then God comes and fills the tabernacle and the people are afraid and all this sort of stuff but he was able to be there with his, his with his children, and he, and he stayed there for a number of years until uh, um, they lost the presence of God, and God didn't come and fill the tabernacle. And, you know, there's you know, about Hophni and Phineas, the sons of Eli, and how they were laying with the daughters at the you know, the door of the tabernacle and all that sort of stuff. They went to take out the Ark of the Covenant and they lost it to the Philistines. And David had to go and get the Ark of the Covenant back. You know the story. If you don't, uh, ask somebody. If not, try and read it for yourself and find out and ask God to lead you. 
so the this prototype of this garden was now um, given to man and but they, they made it religious uh, they missed the point they missed the point of going to the top of the mountain they missed the point of being intimate with God they missed the point of just spending time with him you know today we don't have that we don't need a tabernacle we don't need to have a veil and curtains we don't need to have a building we, we just we, we tabernacle with him he, he is in us he dwells within us we are the tabernacle of the living God we are the temple of the living God we don't, there is no separation between us and God we can speak to him whenever we like but the thing is they weren't they, they couldn't do that because of that separation and so David understood when he got the Ark of the Covenant back from you know Abinadad's house and then you know he started to worship the thing about worship God's tracked to worship and he came down and he, you know Uzzah was slain and all that sort of stuff and everything and oh um uh a uh, high um, on, on the on the horse and cart, or the oxen cart, on the way back to Jerusalem, they left the Ark of the Covenant at, at uh, Obed Edom's house, and, uh, and David had to go back and study the books of law and to understand how to transport the Ark, and he did. He, he realised, okay, look, you know, we, we need to put this Ark on shoulders, and that's a shadow us that the ark of the covenant is here it's us you know it, it's the mind of christ it's the and it's it's the garden of god you know it's it's putting on the head of christ which is jesus he's the head and we're the body of christ and and he gets the he gets the ark of the covenant back to jerusalem david and and this is and this is why hear me very clearly he gets the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem and he puts it in a tent and you know what David does? He danced naked and you know why he danced naked? and I always ask God, well, God what, what is that? What, what's he doing dancing naked? dancing naked for? I'll tell you why because he got the Ark of the Covenant back into the garden and it's in the garden that he really rediscovered his innocence and to walk before God naked. That doesn't mean you get to take off all your clothes and just walk around naked. No. <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that's a that's a shadow. You know, this is Amos chapter nine verse eleven talks about that shadow. It says in that day. I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. I'll repair the breaches thereof. And those breaches is, is um, human failure, human weakness, where we've tried to do something that... You know, we've tried to do something in our strength that doesn't require a strength and never, ever will. Why? Because it required, this requires birthright. It's something that the prodigal son eventually woke up to. When he said, when he came to his senses and he looked back at his father's house and said, well, if I can only be, you know, one of the servants, then, you know, I, I'll be doing better than what I'm doing right now. But when he ran back to his father, you know, his father ran to meet him halfway and he put that ring on his finger and clothed him in a robe and you know put new shoes on his feet and killed kill the fatted calf you know he said yeah he said you're my son and it restored him back to his rightful place and the thing about the prodigal son is that he never he, he was was never anything else but a son but he allowed himself to believe otherwise so what I'm saying today is this, that you and I 
part of this garden where these trees are righteous as we are the planting of the Lord and we're, we're awakening to the realization that we aren't something or someone who's got to try to be like that first mentality the prodigal son tried to take on no just a servant, no, if I could just be like a servant, then no, no, we, we're, we're a son, we've always been a son, we've always been a daughter, we've never not been a son, and when we get into that place of oneness with the Father, when we run to Him and meet Him, He's going to meet us halfway, and we he, and He falls on our necks, you see, neck means will, it's our will. Some of us are real strong-willed. We like to do our own thing. But when we submit our will to the Father's will, because the Father's neck fell on the Son's neck, when our will submits to the Father's will, and then the Father kissed him the cheek. So kiss means identity. Just like when, you know, um, Peter, you know, kissed Jesus, in the garden he identified Jesus to the, the soldiers okay this so when someone kisses you it manifests identity and that's what the father was doing he was saying you're my son you'll always be my son you'll never not be my son and I want you to walk in that reality not in this other prodigal son or this other, you know, uh, slave mentality. I don't want you to walk in on that trying to become someone. I don't want you to walk in knowing who you've always been. And it's in that that we begin to realize, hey, that we are this incredible creature, this new creation. It's a part of this amazing mandate, this Genesis 128 mandate, to be fruitful and multiply that fruit and fill the whole earth with that fruit, and turn this whole place into a garden of love and joy and peace and stuff, which changes the whole atmospheric presence the place, whether that's in your house, whether it's in your church, whether it's in your community, whether it's in your uh, city or town or, or state or nation, that's spreading the garden, that's 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 revealing the garden of Eden, that's manifesting the garden of Eden in all the earth. me that's that's what it's about it's about manifesting the presence of God is bringing heaven into earth in and through us God doesn't do anything without without us he does it through us we are the vessels he chose to put his seed in to manifest through us want to give you some food for thought understand the Garden of Eden is not limited to being a place it's more a who person it's, it's you and I it's the corporate expression of the body of Christ the bride of Christ it has this incredible mandate to fill the whole earth with his glory to sink in and, and let God just wash over you with that understanding. Yeah. So I'll just leave it at that. I just want to bless you.